Okay, I think we are connected. Um, my name is Karen Parker and uh, Christina at the Greer Art Museum asked me to uh, maybe give a little more background on uh, some of the information in my uh, burning series painting, the Watchfires uh, painting. It's a really long and complicated title, so we'll just call it Watchfires. <laughs> Um, and I want to thank uh, the Hickory Museum of Art for inviting me to do this uh, and be able to kind of share uh, some of my um, thoughts and artwork with you. And also, I'd like to thank Christina for her uh, patience and uh, hard work. She really has uh, done a great job. And I always like to say about people who uh, do the jobs that I would not like to do, <laughs> thank you, because that means I don't have to do them. Um, so let me give you a little my art background. Um, I started drawing when I was um, like nine or ten in that age. Um, nobody really in my family, I have an uncle who carved birds, beautiful uh, carvings. Uh, so there are some genes in there somewhere, uh, but it wasn't really uh, emphasized uh, in my family. So I started drawing and then uh, I realized that it was something I could uh, that was challenging enough. That was the main thing, that uh, I was challenged and I could accomplish it. All those things kind of tied up in a ball. So uh, the burning series uh, started off as an academic exercise. I'm an academic painter, and that means I kind of look to the past uh, and see what other people did and how I can apply that to my stuff now. Um, it's not uh, Picasso inventive or creative. Uh, it is creative in that it sets parameters for itself. Like I'm only going to do this or I'm only going to do that. And sees how far you can push that envelope, right? Um, Picasso uh, was also uh, an academ academic painter initially. And then he found something uh, that helped break painting open for him. Uh, and so he was able to take another set of rules uh, and apply them. So uh, the burning series started as an academic exercise. The, the question my, I asked myself was, can I paint uh, fire convincingly uh, that, so that it looks uh, fire-like? Um, so let me start sharing the PowerPoint we can discuss. So, so the, um, the computer is talking to me and I have to pay attention. <laughs> so this is uh, the, the image I chose. It was um, uh, wildfires. Um, I kind of scanned through the internets and uh, magazines and, and tried to find something uh, that was um, challenging but doable, right? Because this is the first time I was trying to do this. Um, so I think it was pretty convincingly uh, fire-like. Um, you can tell it's a bicycle and some next to a building um, or some kind of structure. So it, it passed the test and then, uh, you know, I just kind of forgot about it. This was uh, um, quite a while ago. I didn't really forget about it, but it wasn't, I did it and I accomplished it. So move on. Um, so in 2015, the summer of 2015 or so, a friend of mine posted uh, an image on social media that I found really interesting. It was um, a Molotov cocktail just kind of uh, sailing uh, <laughs> through the air and is obviously a part of a larger picture and uh, she was angry about something and she wanted to express that anger and you know she was basically bombing uh the the idea right um her anger she was expressing the that with the, the Molotov cocktail and I found that really amusing because we've all been there we've all been angry enough to just you know either blow up ourselves or you know metaphorically blow something up so um, I decided to paint that image and uh, see, see where that took me because then it became not just about the fire, 
but about kind of the uh, the physical presence of fire intersecting with things with the symbolic meanings we give it. Right. Fire stands for anger. Fire stands for passion. Fire stands for anger, rage, hatred. Um, you know, also, uh, you know, love, burning love. Right. So fire kind of is this very primal and in a very kind of real and uh, metaphorical way. It's a it's a primal thing to us. And um, so I painted this one um, and I still find it amusing. And I think it's because I've tagged it uh, with that emotional content from my friend. You may not find it amusing, but I do. Um, so um, from there, I started looking for more images or parts of images. Uh, so a lot of these uh, next paintings are kind of uh, collages of different um, images from the same uh, incident or time period um, or, you know, they're, they're grouped together in some way. And so I just kind of pick and choose and kind of collage them together and then do a painting uh, based on that. So my painting style is academic realism. Uh, and so I want to talk about uh, formalism versus romanticism, because to me, uh, as I describe it to my students, that always has a lot to do with uh, what the artist's initial um, uh, premise is. So I started out uh, as an academic exercise, but then I realized the romantic aspects of it. And the romantic doesn't mean love in the way that we're used to thinking about it. Romantic means um, you kind of bend the rules or stretch the rules or break the rules. So Goya um, would be uh, with those very attenuated figures would be romantic. Picasso would kind of fall into that uh, category, although there are a lot of academic exercises he was trying to do with cubism. Um, uh, let's see who else kind of distorted the, the, the impressions to a certain degree, the Fauvist for sure. Uh, they were all interested in not exactly portraying your everyday experience. So not exactly portraying uh, a still life or not exactly portraying uh, a bustling city street. Uh, the Fauvist especially wanted you to, to using color transcend that everyday awareness. They wanted to give you a greater awareness, a more uh, transcendent awareness, uh, transcendent awareness of color. So that's the romantic part is it takes you out of your everyday experience. Um, so when I was looking at these people, um, you, I kind of mentally sort things. <laughs> and um, it, they started kind of falling into, uh, you know, people who wanted to do something new and different or people who wanted to kind of uh, look to the past and uh, take that into consideration. So formalists would look to the past. Uh, romantic uh, would, um, an a person who's academic would look uh, to the past. Uh, romantic would look to the future. So another way to think about this, if you... Um, aren't that familiar with art history is to think about people who are introverts versus people who are extroverts. Now, me, I'm very introverted. Um, in fact, the WebEx uh, school thing has been great for me. <laughs> I, you know, I, I feel bad for people who uh, are extroverts and don't get the social contact they need. Um, but introverts kind of are contained and constrained and they uh, are inwardly looking and um, they rely on themselves. And extroverts are more in the romantic vein in that they're other seeking. They seek other people. They seek new experiences. They seek excitement sometimes. Um, and so uh, if you want to think about the image uh, in or the people in the image that way, that would be uh, very helpful. So um, another way to think about it, if you're pattern oriented, is to think about um, pattern similarities versus pattern differences. And that goes back to formalism uh, or academic painting. Uh, pattern similarities would be um, how, how is this painting like other paintings that have already been painted? Uh, 
how can I use those ideas in the painting, those older paintings, to make myself a new a new thing? How can I refashion those ideas into a new thing that is consistently and obviously linked uh, to this uh, pattern similarity, right? Extroverts or uh, romantics would say, how can I make the new? How can I break the mold? How can I um, make the patterns different, right? In a really substantial um, new way, right? So let's think about all these things as we're uh, we're moving along. So uh, the subject choices when I was going through, oh, I guess yeah, I need to give you some background. I will do that in the next slide or two. Let me go through another uh, little bit of um, burning series and tell you about them. So um, the things I found interesting about this image, um, it's My brain just stopped working. Um, it's in England. It was an incident that happened after uh, a young man was uh, killed by the police in an unfortunate incident that we're now all too familiar with in America. Um, and uh, they uh, there was protest. It turned into uh, burning things. And eventually somebody decided setting the post office on fire would be a great idea. And um, what I found interesting is this is a, a view from the back, so it's different uh, from usual um, uh, crowd paintings or uh, even crowd photographs. You usually don't look at the uh, the, the heads of people who, <laughs> who have their backs turned to you. Um, and that makes you part of the crowd, right? Um, the other thing I found interesting is uh, the use of cell phones uh, that uh, it somehow you're in the presence of this massive fire. I mean, it's huge. Look at it, smoke just billowing out of it. Um, and people are there, but the camera, the the camera is separating them, the, the cell phone camera. They're looking at that screen rather than kind of attending the present moment. Uh, this is called the revolution uh, may be digitized, and that's a kind of play on a uh, poem from the 1970s uh, entitled "The Revolution Will Not Be Televised." Um, evidently, uh, he was wrong, <laughs> um, but it was that kind of presence and separation that I found uh, really kind of super interesting. Um, and uh, this is uh, in Tottenham in uh, England. This is called Inaugural uh, from um, 2016. Um, and it was uh, after, uh, on Inauguration Day, there were a lot of protests. And um, the interesting uh, image that I saw was this uh, limousine, stretch limousine that was on fire. Um, and somebody had sprayed an anarchist symbol on the, in our instance, it would be on the opposite side of the car. But I moved it to this side so we could all see it because I found that kind of graphically really interesting. Um, it also leads your eye up uh, to the car, to the crossbar of the A. Um, and there were a lot of uh, police officers dressed in um, all kinds of gear, uh, standing around kind of guarding certain areas, uh, mostly the, the wealthier areas. Uh, uh, and there was, what struck me about this image and these people uh, guarding these very wealthy neighborhoods was they're barely working for what would be in D.C. because it's a very expensive place to live, uh, would barely be considered minimum wage. Um, and so um, he's given the side eye to that car uh, in a way that um, it's making, I think it's a commentary, so I'll just leave it at that. Oh, I'm going backwards. Um, this is uh, called Beautiful Apartment, Brilliant View, and it's also in England uh, in a very wealthy neighborhood. Um, the apartment itself uh, is not, I looked up uh, some real estate listings in, uh, in England and uh, in the neighborhood, but not exactly the place where uh, the Grenfell fire happened. 
And uh, so the Grenfell fire was a, a travesty. Uh, this Grenfell apartment was low income and middle income housing units for families. And um, it was a multi-story dwelling. So a skyscraper, basically like 10 or 12, I think, stories. Uh, and most of the buildings in those kind of wealthier areas are very low, like three or four at the most um, stories high. So the local people were complaining that it was, you know, Grenfell Tower was reducing their tax. I mean, making their taxes, their value of their properties go down and the whole, you know, NIMBY kind of thing. Um, and when it came time to reclad it, uh, the council of that area got together and said, okay, well, let's see what we've got. And they chose a cladding that was uh, about $4 less uh, expensive per piece uh, than another cladding. Uh, the cheaper material was not fireproof. The one that would cost more was more fire resistant. Um, and the way they put it on uh, created a situation where when w one of the apartments caught fire, it updrafted the fire to the whole building and a lot of people died, um, all for $4 a sheet of cladding, which I, I found really uh, horrific to think about. Um, so uh, again, that kind of uh, passion and anger comes in into play. I gotta really remember where I'm at on that. Uh, this is from uh, Paris. And if you remember the fire of the Notre Dame Cathedral, um, such a striking image. Uh, lightning had uh, uh, struck the building as it was being worked on. And around that same time, almost simultaneous uh, with that, was a series of protests that had been going on over the summer um, where uh, the gas tax had gone up. And uh, so it was the increase was going to mostly impact the working class people who who drove uh, vehicles, who uh, lorry drivers or truck drivers, uh, and it was going to impact uh, all kinds of people. And so, in in the transportation business, and so uh, people went out and started protesting, and then other people joined in solidarity. And most of the people um, started wearing yellow vests because that was their kind of work uniform. They were showing that this was an issue that was going to affect them due to their work situation. Um, in one of the images I found, uh, one, they were holding a flag. Um, and you can see me representing that there on the lower left of your screen. Uh, and it says, Nous sommes aussi inflammable. I'm not pronouncing that right because I don't speak French, <laughs> but what it means, what it says is uh, we're also flammable. So what they're saying is uh, our passions can be ignited. Uh, we can become angry about the situation. And uh, the gentleman who is gesturing uh, kind of graphically in the middle of the image or more toward the middle of the image is kind of a, a physical representation of that. Um, so I heard about the show from one of my students at CBCC. I teach uh, studio classes and art appreciation and occasionally art history. Um, and she emailed me and said, have you heard about the show at the Hickory Museum? And I thanked her and said, I'd look into it. And I did. And um, I was casting about for a reason uh, to um, to uh, send in uh, a submission for the show. And um, I started looking into, I knew some of the history of the vote and of the feminist movement, but it wasn't in depth. It was just kind of, okay, I know the basic things that everybody knows. Um, and um, when I started reading about the Okokwan workhouse and uh, the thing that we're gonna talk about called the Night of Terror, uh, and then I started reading about the protest outside of President Wilson's, uh, outside of the White House, where they were burning his speeches in protest. And I was like, ah, okay, this is this could work, right? But what hooked me, and here's my sketch that I sent in to kind of, as an idea of, of what I wanted to accomplish. Uh, here's the finished painting, um, and uh, we're going to go through and talk about a few of these people. 
But the little lady right in the center, the little old lady is what hooked me on this image uh, or doing this painting. I was looking through the National Archives uh, at some of the images they had about the protests. And uh, this is kind of a modified version, but the little old lady is as close to what she looked like as I, as I could get her given my skill. Um, she was tiny. Uh, she was uh, immaculately dressed. Uh, she had a, a lovely little hat with a flare on the side. She had this massive purse. Uh, she had a cane. And I was like, she's got to be 70. She's got to be 75. And this is in, you know, uh, 1918. What? does she think is going to happen? I mean, does she think that it's suddenly going to pass and then everything will be good? Because she's lived so long without the vote. She's lived so long as kind of this second class citizen. And she won't, even if it passes, she won't benefit that much from it because, you know, her lifespan is almost over, especially considering the time period and the fact that they're in the middle of a pandemic. And so I found that really uh, engaging because here she was uh, doing something possibly for herself, but, but I can imagine her thought process. If I don't get to use, have the vote, I can fight for the people in the future who will have it, right? Uh, because that's got to start somewhere. You don't erode the Grand Canyon uh, all at once. You erode it with billions of years of drops of water. You know, we're all that one drop of water, be the drop of water, um, I've heard say. And so you just kind of keep pushing and pushing on an issue. And then eventually it seems like, wow, okay, that's done. But she didn't know that at that time. And yet she was willing to go to jail um, or a workhouse, and uh, a lot of those women spent weeks. Uh, and one uh, Alice Paul, I think it was, uh, maybe not Alice Paul, uh, spent. It wasn't Alice Paul. I can't tell you the person's name right off the top of my head, <laughs> but you can look her up. Look up Night of Terror, Oakland. She spent uh, seven months. Uh, in uh, various uh, facilities. Part, part of the time here, and when she started going on a hunger strike, they moved her to another facility where she was force-fed. These women endured uh, beatings. They endured uh, abuse by the guards. Uh, they had water that was dirty. They didn't, drinking water. They didn't have clean drinking water. Their food was filled with vermin, bugs, and maggots. Uh, they had rats running around their rooms at night or their jail cells. Um, and, um, you know, when they started, the women started protesting and acting up in jail, like, please, you know, treat us like human beings, because these are upper and middle class women. These are white women who never got into trouble with anybody. They were totally unprepared for uh, what was going to happen to them. Um, and so... Uh, the, when that happened, when they started causing trouble, the uh, warden of the Okaquan workhouse told the guards, just, you know, work them over. And they did. They stripped them naked. They chained them to the, or handcuffed them to the bars of the uh, jail cell. It was horrific. Um, and yet she comes out of that situation and she's put together and she's uh, composed and so I found that really, uh, I admired her. Uh, and so part of the reason for doing this painting is because these women uh, need to have this, we need to have the conversation about these women because they sacrificed a lot, um, a lot of discomfort, a lot of pain, a lot of fear for us, right? So we could have uh, the right to vote. Let's see. Um, when I started putting people in here, I first started with the North Carolina contingency of uh, notable feminists because, you know, we, we did our part and uh, we get to have a say. <laughs> so uh, on the uh, right hand side of the screen, the woman coming down the steps, 
uh, is Alice Paul, or was supposed to be her. Uh, she's leaving Oquaquan, uh months after the Night of Terror, um, and so uh, she is meeting with, from left to right, uh, Dr. Jew. Julia Cooper, on the far left, uh, was born a slave in Raleigh, North Carolina. She was, uh, by all accounts, a brilliant uh, and gifted woman. Um, she uh, was so academically gifted that when she went to college, uh, classes that were normally reserved for only men, she was able to uh, place her way into. Um, she received her uh, PhD in history from the Sorbonne in 1924 and became the fourth African-American woman to earn a doctoral degree. Uh, next to her in the white hat with the little feather on it is Mary, Dr. Mary Cowper. Uh, she's, uh, she was an advocate for labor, labor legislation for women and children, not women with children, but labor legislation for children because uh, in that time period, uh, women and children were hired uh, to work in factories more so than men. They were smaller. They could get inside the machines, the children especially. So uh, children ages 6 to 15, uh, essentially, 6 to 12, were hired to work in these cotton mills uh, to, do, uh, to be spinners, to be weavers. And uh, a lot of kids uh, were mangled. A lot of kids died. Uh, they worked 12 hour days for uh, a lot less money than uh, both men and women were making, which is why they were hired. They would they could basically uh, the factory owners and the managers could get them for next to nothing. Um, so uh, Mary Cowper uh, one worked on tried to work on getting legislation passed uh, for worker protection um, and uh, probably to get child labor laws changed in America. Uh, Gertrude Wheel is the woman in the back with a little rose petal on her uh, coat. Uh, she formed the North Carolina Equal Suffrage Leagues, among other things. She fought for secret ballots. Um, she was a member of the Socialist Party, which is what the rose uh, symbolically stands for in this instance. I think they are still using that. Um, so, uh, when uh, the vote was passed and she got to go vote, uh, I think probably for the first or second time, she walked into the polling place and all the ballots had been pre-marked for uh, the people the local uh, politicians thought should win the race. And they, they thought she was just going to, you know, women were just going to walk in, take a ballot and go, oh, it's been pre-marked and then uh, vote. But uh, she was not having any of that. <laughs> she went through got every ballot in the place that was pre-marked and tore them up. And I admire her for that. And so uh, this is uh, maybe, uh, I, I don't have the gumption to do that, but I, I hope in my heart of hearts that I would. Um, let's see. She became involved in the fight for civil rights as early as 1930. Uh, and what you'll see throughout the people I discuss is there's this kind of understanding that uh, labor and uh, uh, women's rights and the rights of minorities are all intertwined, that they all uh, support each other because otherwise they're just factions, none of which are strong enough to get what they want uh, out of the government who is supposed to represent us. And so together they had a stronger voice. And uh, if not for that reason, then for just the sheer humanity of treating your fellow human beings in a good way, uh, they all kind of join together. Um, let's see, Dr. Uh, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, she was an author, educator, and founder of the Palmer, Palmer uh, Memorial Institute in Sedalia, North Carolina. Uh, she, was, she named it after Alice Palmer, who advocated higher education for women so that they were better, a, better able to support themselves and be independent. Um, because again, uh, uh, when uh, women have their own kind of core uh, abilities, um, uh, they are less, a, less likely to stay in situations that are not um, good for them. 
And so uh, she opened the school. Uh, it became a nationally recognized boarding school for African-American students, many who went on to become uh, educators themselves. Um, she didn't finish college, but she went one year and then um, started working uh, at, at a school teaching and realized that she could do more good uh, kind of on the ground. Uh, so uh, she she uh, is I think the school is still uh, functioning, if I'm not mistaken. So you'll notice uh, on the far uh, left. Uh, there is a sign that says Men's League for Women's Suffrage. Just to the left of that, there's a woman wearing a mask because in the uh, late 1800s, we had a pandemic that affected everybody in the world. And uh, there is a quote that is often attributed uh, to Mark Twain, who said, um, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. And uh, because I like to be, <laughs> Sure of my sources, I went and looked that up, and that's not true. But what he did say, which is very similar, uh, but much more prettily worded, um, no, no occurrence is sole and solitary, but merely a repetition of a thing which has happened before and perhaps often. So uh, when you, when I tell my students, when you look back through history, notice that there are cycles of things, cycles of pandemics, cycles of economic crashes. And so if you can kind of sort of get a handle on uh, history in that in those cyclical terms, uh, the future isn't quite so scary or surprising uh, because uh, everything old is new again, I think is the way my mom used to say it. Um, so we're having a pandemic in 1918. People refused to wear masks. People thought that it was an abridgment of their, uh, their rights. Uh, they protested. Um, and some people, a good number of people, uh, wore masks. So this should all sound incredibly familiar. And I tell my students that if you are uh, a person who likes to keep a journal, or maybe even if you aren't, uh, it, it would be good uh, for you to write down some things about uh, the world as you see it, because in 100 years in the future, when a similar situation rolls around, somebody's going to want to read what you had to say. They may take solace in... Uh, and what you uh, thought about the situation you were in. Uh, the Men's League for Women's Suffrage, uh, we have to acknowledge our allies. <laughs> Some people think that feminism is uh, anti-man, uh, but uh, if you kind of uh, think about logically what I had said before about minorities and children and women and labor, uh, that all these things are together, that includes men. Uh, we want men's uh, rights to be uh, just as valued as women's. Um, so uh, men, uh, sensible men, um, uh, saw the moral and ethical sense in treating other people fairly, uh, just as women do uh, in, in the same situations. Uh, we're all human beings first. So next, if you look a little below them, we've had the lady smoking a cigarette uh, with a friend of hers and a in a big coat. Those are the flappers. So after 1920, when the uh, vote was passed and uh, all these, uh, you know, the co uh, Constitution was ratified. Um, is that the right word? Can't remember. Don't care. Uh, <laughs> the flappers kind of became this symbol of the new woman. Uh, they smoked in public. They drank. They, uh, you know, wore short skirts. Um, they got jobs, they could forestall marriage, um, and so they were uh, understanding that the social mores for women had changed and that uh, everything that they could do, uh, wanted to do, was possible. The vote kind of said, what you want to do is possible. And so they just took that and ran with it. And so that's why they became kind of a symbol of that age this kind of woman who could get an education, a woman who didn't have to get married if she didn't want to, um, and so on. Uh, so Helen Keller, how did I get you to find Helen Keller? She is uh, behind the ladies of the Equal Rights Envoy to President Coolidge. She's kind of in the middle. She's wearing a red rose because uh, she was a member of the Socialist Party. Uh, and what's interesting to me about Helen Keller is that uh, 
she was uh, deaf and blind and uh, for many, many years as a child could not speak because she didn't have access to language at that point. Uh, and it is interesting that she overcame that those massive uh, handicaps uh, through uh, good teaching and the force of her will. Uh, but what's more interesting to me is what happens with people in history is that all the all the interesting rough edges kind of get polished away. All the stuff that uh, is juicy. Um, and what you're left with is this very kind of clean, um, sanitized version of who that person was. And so with Helen Keller, uh, she belonged to the Socialist Party and the industrial workers of the world. She led strikes. She gave speeches to these people. Uh, she spoke to uh, the National Women's Party. Um, I can't remember the exact title of that. I should have written it down. Uh, she com campaigned for women's suffrage, labor rights, uh, socialism, and anti-militarism. So she was a very uh, complicated and educated woman. She had uh, a lot of independent thoughts. And I guess after overcoming such uh, a rocky start, uh, she probably did, again, see the possibilities. She saw that she could do uh, anything she set her mind to. And so why not go uh, for the greater good? Uh, the next person I want to talk about is a North Carolina, na not a native, but she lived here uh, for a good portion of her life. Uh, she moved here from uh, Tennessee uh, to an African-American neighborhood outside of Bessemer City and worked in a racially integrated uh, cotton mill in uh, Gastonia called Lowry Mill. And her name was Ella Mae Wiggins. And um, she had nine children. She was a folk singer. One of her most famous songs uh, was Mill Mother's Lament. Uh, she uh, was part of the movement to start a union, uh, a labor union for uh, textile factory workers in the South. And when it came time to kind of vote on their charter, uh, she insisted that it be racially integrated. Uh, so again, uh, people often think of the distant passes when, you know, segregation was this kind of hard and fast wall. But the working class, uh, again, understands that the way you um, the way you're stronger is if you don't pit yourself against people in the same in the same situation. Uh, instead, you uh, pool your resources. Um, so. Uh, she worked as a spinner in American Mill Number no. Two, twelve-hour days, uh, six days a week, and she earned about nine dollars a week, which was less than the men earned, um, but again, um, probably more than the children earned. Um, in 1929, she traveled with a group of textile workers to D.C. to testify to the Senate about labor conditions and safety conditions in the South in these mills. Uh, she described losing four of her nine children to whooping cough. Uh, she was fired from her job when she asked her manager for a different shift uh, so that she could be with her children when their uh, coughing spells were at their worst. Um, and uh, he didn't want to deal with that, so he just fired her. He said, no, you're fired. And again, because labor was so cheap and easy to get because everybody was desperate for, well, people in the working class were desperate for jobs. And um, relating that to today, um, you have a lot of people uh, out of their jobs because of the pandemic um, and the labor market uh, is shifting. And so uh, you can look for the value of the, uh, you know, the pay that people are willing to take uh, to become less and less um, for that same kind of reason. Um, that um, it's just easy to fire somebody for being a trouble and uh, getting a new person uh, for probably less money. So with no job, there was no medicine. Uh, and with no medicine, the children died. So four of her kids died. In April of that same year, 1,800 mill workers from Lowry walked off their jobs to protest dangerous conditions and demand reasonable hours and compensation. Uh, they asked for a 40-hour work week, uh, so 
Previously, you'd work 10 or 12 hours a day uh, and a minimum $20 a week wage, union recognition and abolition of the stretch out system, double the work and reduce the pay. And my mother was a factory worker. She worked at, uh, when I was a very young girl, she worked at Bassett Sack in Winston-Salem. As I got older and we moved back to Statesville, uh, she worked at uh, Clark Schwabel. Um, it became Clark Schwabel. It was a different uh, factory. Somebody bought it later. But she was a spinner. She was a weaver. Um, she worked um, uh, very long hours and was very good at her job. And in that, looking at Ella Mae Wiggins' life, uh, I could see echoes of my mother, who was the daughter of a tenant farmer um, and grew up uh, in uh, an area that had a, a lot of tenant farmers, both black and white. And so uh, the story, um, I understood it. It was pattern recognition, right? It was something I already understood and understood why she did what she did, why Elle Mae Wiggins would write songs about her heartache over losing her children or would um, join a union or protest uh, the working conditions that she was in, right? Um, and so, uh, let's see, where are we? Oh yeah, double, double the work and, and the same pay. So my mother had gone through a time, uh, I can't remember exactly when, but I, I think it was in the mid 70s or early 80s uh, where they were doing a similar thing, where your production quota was uh, increased, but you didn't get any more uh, compensation for doing that. Uh, and so that's what Elle Mae Wiggins was striking for is to kind of have that reduced. Um, so um, in September of that year, so later on after the strike had been uh, going on for a while, uh, so she was traveling toward the mill to go join the protest. And uh, Wiggins and the group of people she was traveling with were ambushed and killed by anti-union mill thugs. So people who were hired by the mill to kind of um, keep people in line uh, during the strike. And... Uh, her five children were sent to live in orphanages. Um, five Lori Mill employees were charged, but were acquitted. Uh, after less than 30 minutes of deliberation in a trial, despite the fact that the crime happened in broad daylight and there were more than 50 witnesses. The uh, protest collapsed as they did across the South, uh, partly because of this because the Gastonium Mill was kind of the test bed for this kind of action. Um, uh, and uh, the union, the National Textile Workers Union, ultimately was too weak to challenge the economic and political power of the cotton manufacturers. So, as I said, my grandfather was a tenant farmer, which is why I included uh, to the uh, behind LMA Wiggins and to the right a little bit uh, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. Uh, which was a union in the South that was uh, formed to help tenant farmers like my grandfather get better deals uh, out of their uh, agreements with uh, the landowners. So in case you don't know, a tenant farmer is somebody who's too poor to uh, own a farm or to have any land to work. And um, they exchange a, a rent for a house or land uh, and sometimes both uh, for uh, a portion of the crops that they grow. And they entered into this agreement uh, with, the far, with the landowner, and um, every year, you know, whatever money they make from selling it or just giving it to the, the landowner to sell for themselves, um, that's the deal they make. And often, again, because these people were so poor and like uh, my grandfather, lacking uh, a formal education, uh, they didn't understand how to get a better, uh, make a better deal. They didn't have to bargain for that kind of stuff. And so, um, let's see. So it was founded uh, during the Great Depression, uh, and uh, women were the backbone doing most of the network organizing and outreach. So the thread that you'll see is uh, that women in these organizations uh, kind of are, they do what, uh, women do best. They 
coordinate. They uh, get together. They talk about things. They figure out how to organize. It's, um, you know, to be a little bit uh, sexist, but not for the time period. <laughs> it's like organizing a house. You have to have your ducks in a row in order to run a house well. And so they understood this already, uh, being uh, people who uh, did that kind of as their daily chore. Uh, so they were uh, the people who kept it together. So you'll see around that little green um, uh, sign, uh, the tenant farmer, uh, the, the African-American gentleman, the blonde gentleman in the coveralls, uh, you know, kind of understanding that they joined together, um, they will... Um, Oh, the computer's talking to me. I'm sorry. Uh, they will be stronger together than apart. Um, let's see. The Women's Emergency Brigade were armed with clubs in order to defend the assaults, uh, assaults of hired uh, Pinkerton strike breakers. You'll see them uh, up above the Southern Tenant Farmers Union and over to the right a little bit. The, these were the auto strikes in, uh, up in Michigan. Uh, Lansing, I think Flint, Lansing, Flint, and Detroit all had sit-down strikes about the same time, uh, and similar to the time that the strikes were going on in the South in the textile mills. Um, they were more successful in unionizing up there, and uh, their uh, pay increased uh, substantially uh, due to that. So the Women's Emergency Brigade was there to uh, take food, uh, give medical attention, keep the households running, households running while the men were on sit-down strike because they didn't leave, they just stayed there. Uh, and uh, I kind of, uh, my husband's great aunt uh, worked, uh, or her father was the president of Wolverine Toy and they had a sit down strike and she was married to one of the guys who worked on the floor. <laughs> so her, her loyalties were kind of divided, but she ended up helping um, the strikers by again, taking them food and clothes and uh, so on. Um, and so uh, the uh, Flint Brigade's uh, berets were uh, red, Detroit's were green and Lansing's were white. So I have those all kind of shown, shown there. Uh, Maria Telkus, where am I? There I am. Maria Telkus is the uh, over by Donald Duck's head, over to the right of that. Uh, she's looking up at a glowing uh, yellow orb, which is supposed to represent the sun. Uh, she was a scientist, inventor, physicist who uh, was called the Sun Queen. Uh, she is the mother of many of the solar power technologies that we kind of. Uh, used today or at least uh, are, are still experimenting on in some cases. Uh, if you've ever taken a pizza box and turned it into a solar oven with your kids, that was Maria Telkus. If you ever heard of solar distilling uh, units where uh, you can use the sunlight to distill water uh, to, to clean it for people who don't live in areas with clean water, that was Maria Telkus. Uh, chemical heat storage from the sun, Maria Telkus. So she and uh, uh, an architect whose name I do not have, Eleanor is her first name, but I do not have her last name written down. I somehow skipped that. Um, with funding from a Boston uh, sculptor, Amelia Peabody, uh, they kind of worked together to build this the first solar uh, heated house uh, in the United States, probably in the world, I mean, with modern technology. Um, so, uh, the people I have chosen don't come from politics. The people I've chosen don't come from uh, kind of super public uh, life. They, they're they people who I think because of the passions that they have, um, have advanced the cause uh, kind of incidentally. Um, they are so uh, kind of focused on this one thing and they do it so well that they end up being uh, good examples of what women are capable of. They don't start out being wanting to be, I want to be a capable woman. They have this passion and it turns into uh, that other thing, uh, not necessarily the other way around. So uh, Marguerite Higgins, and I'll 
wrap it up here in a minute. I uh, hope you guys are, are still with me. Uh, Margaret Higgins is behind the sign that says The Second Sex, which is a uh, novel by, or a philosophy book by um, Simone de Beauvoir in uh, France, uh, kind of the forerunner of uh, modern feminism in America. Um, she is on the the side closer to us. She's kind of wearing a little, uh, looks like a uniform almost. She was a war correspondent. And um, she uh, was a correspondent for uh, the press in the Second World War. She did uh, journalism uh, during the Second World War. And so when the Korean War broke out, uh, she was in Korea and um, over there kind of reporting on things on the ground because the buildup had been uh, coming. Uh, she was ordered out of the country by a man named General Walton Walker. And he argued that women didn't belong in on the front, and the military had no time to worry about making separate accommodations for women. Well, uh, again, uh, hoping that I'm that person, <laughs> she went over his head to his commander, um, General uh, Douglas MacArthur. And so MacArthur probably had read some of uh, uh, Higgins reporting, certainly, if he was a, as intelligent a man as they say. Um, and he wrote to uh, the Herald Tribune in a telegram, and he said, ban on women correspondents in Korea has been lifted. Marguerite Higgins is held in the highest professional esteem by everyone. Uh, so, again, it's, it's being really good at what you do, having a passion for it, and, and holding true to uh, your core beliefs. Uh, and people will see that, and they won't care if you're a, a man or a woman uh, if you do that. Um, let's see. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks uh, is um, the woman behind the sign that says uh, Brown v. Board of Education. And again, this is one of those stories that, that time tends to sand off the edges and take the truth, most of the truth away. Um, we think of Rosa Parks and think of somebody, a seamstress who was tired. And when the front of the bus filled up, she was supposed to get up and move all the way to the back of the bus um, so a white man could have a seat. But that's not really the whole story. Uh, she wasn't exactly apolitical about uh, civil rights, but she wasn't an activist either. She was concerned, but not. she didn't see a way out of the situation. She was in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, deeply segregated, deeply uh, racist uh, area at the time. Uh, and she kind of didn't know how to proceed, but... She got a job on a military base, Maxwell Air Force Base, which is uh, racially segregated. Uh, racial segregation in the military happened during World War II. So this is, you know, years later. And she got a job there um, at, for a time. And uh, because it wasn't racially segregated, she could sit on a trolley uh, surrounded by white people. She could eat in the cafeteria with all the white people. Um, so... You know, she saw that things could be different if uh, just some pressure was applied. So she started going to workshops about how to, uh, you know, be activist in these in these arenas. And uh, so she was prepared. She knew what she was getting into. She didn't just arbitrarily decide to not get up and move. She knew that it would have an impact. And it did. Uh, it was just at the right time. Right. Um, Rachel Carson's is kind of to the front of her, and she's holding a little jar of uh, what looks to be radioactive water. <laughs> I didn't know how to paint that uh, to make it look like chemicals, but I, I tried. Uh, she was an aquatic biologist in the U.S. Bureau of Fish Fisheries in the late 50s, and she became concerned about the use of synthetic pesticides in uh, wildlife areas and in wetlands. Um, uh, if you're a child of the 60s and 70s, you may remember the DVT spraying that went on in those times. The trucks would roll down the streets in the city and these fog machine of, you know, DDT would be sprayed everywhere. 
Um, and uh, she was right. It turned out it was creating uh, problems for uh, frogs are very susceptible to those kind of things. But also the condors, California condors, eggs uh, almost went extinct because the eggs uh, shells were thinner uh, due to the use of DT DDT in the in the water systems. Um, the result was the book Silent Spring, uh, which on the one hand fiercely was opposed by chemical companies uh, because it was going to impact their bottom line um, in terms of profit. And, uh, but on the other hand, it inspired grassroots environmental movements that led to the creation of the EPA. Earth Day, plant a tree, give a hoot, don't pollute type uh, things. Um, these all sprang out of this consciousness raising uh, book that Rachel Carson wrote. And again, it wasn't that she was out to do that. She just was trying to um, express her feelings uh, uh, and her ideas and her theories about what was going on. But people saw that she was dedicated to it and what it actually meant. She was clear enough in her communication that people understood her intent and uh, took it to heart. Um, I think we're close to, yeah, we've got a few more, like two or three. Uh, Bobby Gibb uh, trained for two years. Bobby Gibb is the um, young blonde lady under the You Don't Own Me sign. The You Don't Own Me uh, was a song uh, of the early 60s, and it was uh, kind of considered uh, because the consciousness about women's uh, the feminist movement, so on, was just taking hold in America. And um, that was kind of considered the first femi feminist anthem. Um, so if you're uh, old enough to remember that song, if you're not, go and uh, look it up. It's a great little uh, uh, teen um, empowerment song. Uh, <laughs> so Bobby Gibb uh, trained for two years for the Boston Marathon. Uh, because there were no running shoes for women, because women weren't considered uh, to be uh, physically strong enough to run marathons, so nobody bothered to make shoes for them, uh, she ran in white leather Red Cross nurse's shoes. Um, her application to run in the marathon was rejected, so uh, she just put on a hoodie and some shorts and joined the race at the beginning uh, without entering the race. She did complete it. Uh, and is a unofficial, considered the first, you know, unofficial woman to run in the Boston, complete the Boston Marathon. Catherine Switzer uh, took a little more strategic approach because she knew that she'd probably get rejected outright if she just, you know, uh, ran as a woman. Uh, she was the first officially recognized female in the Boston Marathon. She checked a rule book and it said uh, nothing about what gender you had to be to run in the uh, marathon. So there's a saying uh, I like to uh, kind of pop out every once in a while when it's appropriate. Better to get forgiven than to get permission. Uh, and so what that means is if you go ahead and do it and you get in trouble, then you can say, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, and so that's essentially what she did. She said, I'm going to run. And uh, she registered for the race using her official amateur athletic union number, her, a race fee, certificate of fitness. Uh, and she signed her name Katie Switzer because she had always signed it that way because of a mix-up on her birth certificate. She didn't want all the confusion uh, that came with having two different names. Um, and so um, she did everything by the book uh, and, and as far as it was descriptive. And she said, on the race day, other runners assembling at the start greeted her entry into the race with support and enthusiasm. So uh, they knew uh, that uh, Bobby Gibb had run and the runners were okay with it. Uh, and the press had kind of made um, mention of it, uh, focusing on her as a runner. Uh, but um, the, uh, in terms of Catherine Switzer, the officials were not happy. So when they figured out it was a, a woman running, uh, one of the officials came up and literally tried to drag her out of the race physically, bodily, grabbing her sweatshirt. <laughs> and the men that she had trained with for a couple of years and her coach uh, body blocked him and said, nope, she's running. And she did. She completed the marathon. So she's the first uh, officially recognized Boston Marathon runner. Uh, next to them is Katherine Johnson. Um, and Katherine Johnson was one of hundreds of women four or 500 uh, women who worked for NASA as com human computers. 
So back in the old days, you didn't have a cell phone. If I had my cell phone, I'd show it to you. It's about like this. It has more technology in it than the first manned uh, flight into space. More technology, more computing power, um, holds more data uh, than all the computers that kind of um, put the man in first man into outer space. So technology's come a long way. Uh, computers used to be, you know, when uh, before com before kind of digital or car the card computers, um, I can't remember what those are called, but they would have human beings uh, do all the calculations, do all the calculus, do all the algebra, whatever it took. Um, they would sit down and figure these things out by hand. One of my favorite pictures uh, from uh, the moon, the um, first person into outer space was a young woman, and she probably 4'11 to 5'1. I couldn't get a real close read on uh, what her actual height was, but she's this tiny little person, and she is standing beside this massive stack of papers that is taller than she is. Those are all the calculations she did by hand to get uh, to contribute to the, you know, launch into outer space. Uh, so these were really bright women. Uh, NASA didn't care if you were black and white or white. They just cared if you could take a pencil and calculate some numbers. And so Katherine Johnson is kind of the face of that. If you haven't seen the movie Hidden Figures, it's a little bit of a flawed picture, but it's still watchable. It's enjoyable. It's very pleasing to look at. Um, and, and I highly recommend it. Um, the women, both black and white, were paid about half as much as their male counterparts, even though they did exactly the same work. Uh, Johnson discovered that the males on her team were attending meetings to share important information about their current tasks because you got to you got to understand what the other people are doing so you can either glean ideas from them or give them ideas and it all works much more smoothly. So she began attending the meetings despite no other women being invited to participate. She didn't get invited. She just said, I'm part of this team. I'm going to go and do the work. Um, and so that's, again, uh, it wasn't, I'm going to be the first woman to do this. It was, it was, I'm going to do my job to the best of my ability uh, with, you know, with this kind of uh, strength of will and this passion. And so she did. And she was groundbreaking. Um, and the, uh, I highly encourage you to get the nine page, uh, PDF. I think it's on the website. You can download it and kind of, uh, if you get a chance, look through and see who these women are. There are some sports figures. There are some politicians. Uh, it doesn't focus. I don't focus on the politicians, but they're there. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is the Wall of Moms. And uh, this was a response to uh, the protest, uh, the gassing and uh, attacking of protesters who were protesting the death of George Floyd. Um, so um, it's also called United Moms uh, for Black Lives. And it, when Floyd uh, died, there was a graffiti that went up soon afterwards because as he was dying, uh, lay there dying, he called out for his mother. And uh, so the graffiti reads, uh, all mothers were summoned when he called out for his mother. Uh, I changed that a little bit uh, just to, for wording's sake, uh, but to me it sounds more pleasing to the ear the way I said it, or at least to my ear. Um, not a better writer. I'm just picky. <laughs> um, and so these uh, protests started and the people were, the young people who were protesting were being uh, gassed against uh, and uh, beaten and kettled, uh, which is putting, kind of blocking them off so that they can't escape and then, you know, gassing, tear gassing them. Uh, so they, somebody said, you know, they probably won't do that to, to somebody's mom, to older women. Um, and so uh, all these moms uh, of varying stripes uh, got together. They decided on a uniform, which was yellow, uh, again, um, uh, kind of a cheery color uh, that's visible. Uh, so 
they would go and they would lock arms and they would kind of cordon off the protesters from the police. Um, these were black women, white women, Latina women, uh, some uh, transgendered people, just all stripes. Because again, we're stronger together than we are apart. And uh, so I found that really interesting. And also the fact that the yellow, you'll notice down there, is kind of saturating that whole bottom of the frame, is a very kind of warm color, not quite uh, burning fire dramatically warm, but it's edging toward that. It's a heat. Um, and so uh, not only these women, but women around the world uh, have similar um, organizations, uh, and they pr are protesting what these women are protesting, that our young people um, are dying. Our young people are being stolen from us. Uh, due to social and economic situations, due to uh, all kinds of uh, things that need to be addressed by the people we, as the government, right, we're the government, we the people, uh, need to uh, talk to our elected representatives about. Uh, across the world, uh, the Wall of Moms is similar to other mothers, wives, and other female relatives who have come together to protest state-sponsored violence and po politicized police action in multiple countries, um, including uh, Argentina's Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, Grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, China in the Tiananmen Mothers, uh, in uh, Cuba, the Ladies in White, Iran, the Mourning Mothers, the Mothers of Kavaran in Mexico, the Mothers of the Disappeared, in Russia, Union of the Committees of Soldiers, Mothers of Russia, Sri Lanka, Mothers of the Disappeared, and Turkey, Saturday Mothers. So women uh, understand that we together are stronger uh, than we are apart, and uh, this is a, a really good example of it. Um, and it also shows you that passion. And that passion, in this instance, that fire uh, is a fire of love. It uh, goes back to the, the kind of the opposite of hate and anger and rage. It moves into this embracing uh, danger uh, because you understand how important your loved ones are. Uh, and, and collectively, uh, we can all... Um, work for each other and with each other uh, to get what we want uh, in the end. So I highly recommend uh, you guys go out and check out all the artwork because there's some fabulous work there in, in the Hickory Museum. Uh, check out not just the, the uh, suffrage show, but the um, show that uh, show some of the, showcases some of the women's art that is in the museum's collection because that's also fabulous. Um, again, I want to thank all of you for joining me. Um, I hope I was clear <laughs> and uh, not too befuddled, uh, have, not having enough caffeine this morning. Um, but I hope you all have um, uh, time before January 24th to go and see the show. Uh, I'm sure uh, Christina will be happy to answer any questions you have if you uh, need to ask me a question directly. Um, and, Maybe uh, you can contact her and she can pass along your information. I look forward to um, seeing you at the museum. If I'm there, I'm going back pretty soon. I have a show I want to see. Um, but I look forward to um, maybe seeing you there. You all have a great day. Let's see what we can do here.